So for several months now, I've been trying to figure out a way to implement studying work into YouTube videos without overcomplicating things. So single-handedly, the most important thing, um, or the, the thing that I attribute most to my growth as an artist and a photographer and just as a person in general, um, but particularly in this skill set, is studying the greats, studying the work of the greats, whether that's great cinema, great photography, or great writing. Um, I like to study kind of what makes the great work great. And I think you can take away so much from it, whether you're looking at it on a technical level, an emotional level, a structural level, there's, there's plenty to take away when you look at truly masterful work. And it's something that I love to do, but I haven't been able to translate that into YouTube videos. And I've tried, obviously I did the um, Forrest Gump Pulp Fiction, I did the Saw Lighter, and I'm extremely happy with those videos, but they take so much time to plan and to put together that it almost defeats the purpose of study. Um, studying is something you want to do on a daily basis. You want it to be consistent and you don't want to get bogged down in little details. You want to take the big picture and apply these things to your work. So <clears throat> I spend so much time looking at backstory and editing with those videos that it, it defeats the purpose of the study in the first place for me. So what I'm going to be testing out today is a new method. Um, and of course, I'll improve over time, but a new method of studying work. We're going to start with one of my favorite photographers, one of the greatest color photographers of all time, Harry Gray Art, and his two of his photos. And these photos are separated by four decades. One was in 1969 and one was in 2016. And um, we're just going to look at them and kind of work through my process of looking at a photograph and um, see what we can learn. So anyways, this is uh, part one in um, trying to uh, figure out how this is done. I'm sure it'll get better over time, but uh, very excited about this and I hope you guys enjoy and take something away from it. All right, so we're gonna be looking at two images today, both by Harry Gray Ott and taken over four decades apart just about. So this is the first of the two. If you've seen any of uh, Gray Ott's work before, you've probably seen this one. This is one of his more famous images and it was taken in 1969 in Morocco. It was taken using Kodachrome slide film. I'm not sure which camera, but I assume a 35 camera similar to a Leica, um, just because I know that's the, the, the camera he used. Um, pretty prevalent back then. The following photo that we're going to be looking at is taken, like I said, 40 years later, just about in 2016 in Paris, France. And there's a couple of things I want to explore about these photos. Uh, one, I want to explore the photographer's eye, what he saw that made him want to take the photo. I feel like that's generally a good way to learn uh, and to train yourself to take better photos is to look at all-time greats, masters of the art form, and what they see, how they see the world, um, what they're looking for. I also want to look at how gray art uses the viewer or how he directs the viewer and directs the viewer's eye through the photograph. Um, some just basic compositional things and stuff like that. But for the most part, um, I do want to focus on the uh, just his eye and what he sees. Another fun thing though, and why I bring up the Kodachrome is there's a technical difference between these two photos and that'll be made clear here in a moment. But, uh, I guess starting with this, one of the first things that caught my eye about this photograph. And uh, if you're familiar with Kodachrome work or slide film work in general, you'll know that this is a characteristic of a lot of it, it's these blacks. So the areas that are not exposed are pretty much lost completely. Um, and actually, one thing I can do to demonstrate this even more is if I change this background to black, you can see it completely just, the photo loses itself, right? It completely vanishes uh, with the background. This is a component of Kodachrome film. 
you didn't have a lot of uh, exposure range or a lot of dynamic range on this this slide film so generally what you would have to do is decide okay do i want my shadows or do i want my highlights and then expose for that if there was like four stops uh, between your brightest bright and your darkest dark, you weren't going to be able to capture all of that data. You were going to have to, um, you were going to have to make a choice, and that's what was done here. And that's uh, done on a lot of photos. But you can see he chose to expose for the shadows or expose for the highlights. Excuse me. And um, it looks like he might have even pushed the film and development a stop or so to completely blow out these these shadow areas. So they're completely gone, and then you do have a little bit of detail here, a little bit of detail here, and a little bit of detail here that he brought back. But if you look closely, it's pretty muddy right here. It's pretty muddy, and it looks like it was probably done in the printing process, um, just to kind of give the give the composition a bit more of a frame. But most of it is is pretty lost. So what I notice, this is the area of greatest contrast, at least for my eye, right here. And then it works into this, and then it goes back to this. And this is kind of how the eye is uh, guided through the scene. So you start here, and you work over, and you have this funky pattern. You work over to these lemons, and then you work over to the guy in the background. And there's a good sense of depth that you've got the pointing here, the pointing here, um, and then you've got this thing pointing here, and then the light bulb there. Um, so you, he really works you and directs your eye across the frame. Uh, I like how it's blown out. There's this, uh, Gary Winogrand used to talk about the job of a photographer is to capture the world, how it looks through a camera. Um, and I feel like Gray Art did a really good job doing that here because he's taken, like this photo is greater than the sum of its parts. If you were to walk up on this scene in real life, it would not look like this, obviously. Our eye is going to find value in this. It's going to find value in this. And it's going to find value in this. And the contrast is not going to be this great if we're looking at it with our eye. Um, but he was able to approach the scene and kind of see beyond what was there. And he made a photo that is fantastic. So just briefly on the color, um, you've got this red and green here. And then you've got there's red and green in the wall, both of them, and blue. You've got the blue here. And then he goes into, there's some yellow here, yellow here, and then yellow, red, red, and then green. So all the colors are very complimentary. Um, you've got his like kind of uh, bluish hoodie in the background, which goes with this, the blue there, the blue there. And I, I'm sure all of that wasn't thought through, but most of this, is, I guarantee you, was, uh, was pretty deliberate, especially kind of how the red and the blue would... Uh, would catch the the contrast here and then how they'd work over now just quickly before we move on i want to look at the histogram for this photo so if you look at the histogram we have a lot of data that's being lost um all the black is pretty much dead you know and Again, that's the characteristic of slide film, and you don't see that a lot in digital. So moving to the next shot, like I said, this was taken almost four decades later uh, on a completely different medium. This was not taken on film. This was not taken on slide film. This was taken on a Canon digital sensor. Now, Grayart did say in a, an interview I listened to where he sat down and talked to Roger Deakins, he did say that he likes to touch up his photos a little bit. Um, before, you know, in the printing process, he likes to add some grain if it's a digital photo. Sometimes they look a little, um, they look a little sharp for his taste, and I agree. But there is a vast difference between this and um, the Kodachrome photograph. And I think the first place to start is the histogram. This histogram is incredibly different, as you can see. So you've got a lot more data in this photograph than you do in this photograph and it's extremely evident and um i don't know this one isn't as striking to me when you first step into it but like um like i think you should do with all photographers i didn't you know didn't judge it by the first uh first thing i saw and i decided okay let's let's look through this and let's see and what i discovered is this is actually an extremely 
complicated, complex, layered, and technical photograph. And we'll start here. We'll just examine the reds. That's the most prominent color in my mind. And so that's where I started when I was looking at the photo was, okay, let's look at the reds. And I found reds in all of these places, kind of stretching from corner to corner, the entire image has red. And then I decided, okay, let's look at the yellow. So the reason I started with color is Grayot is known as, you know, a color photographer. He sees the world in color. So I figured that was the best place to start and move to yellows. And as you can see, yellow all across the frame. He waited for the girl in yellow pants to step out. He waited for the girl in the yellow rain jacket to, you know, be in view of the camera. He framed up the red very deliberately. The blues, very deliberately. All of these stretch across the entire image. And if you connected the dots, it would look like waves, right? So you've got your reds. This isn't completely right, but you get the point. You've got your yellows and right there, and you've got your blues. And then obviously you've got foreground, midground, background. But then I started looking closer and I discovered that, wow, if you look at the areas of color that I just outlined, look at the light, how the light hits those areas. So he sees this photo in exactly the same way. Every, every colored spot has light hitting it. So the, the same way that he saw this photograph, he saw this photograph in the exact same way. So that one and that one are the exact same um, through his eye. And this is probably closer representation to what this scene actually looked like. So I was wondering, okay, Obviously, limitations of the digital sensor or non-limitations of the digital sensor are what's giving this much dynamic range. There's so much detail. So I wondered what would happen if you tried to match this histogram to this. And so I did. And that gives us this. So as you can see, very, very different. Much closer to the first one. So you can see the histograms very similar when matched, but look now it's a completely different looking photo when you completely blow the shadows. So Grayot was used to working in this. This is what he did for, you know, three, four decades as he shot film. And when he moved to digital, his eye didn't change, but the technology did. So I thought this was just a really cool example. This is a completely different looking photo. Um, and so I think one thing it could teach us is don't be afraid to be drastic with your edits. Um, who knows? Maybe this is closer to what gray art sees and this is closer to what he wants to be represented in his photography. And due to limitations, he couldn't do this before, but now he has digital and he's able to, uh, that could very well be true. But as you can see, this is a very, um, it's a very dynamic image. So I think if anything, um, if we learn anything from these, it's, you know, you have to see things, um, that aren't really clear, uh, when you're, when you're photographing and that's just a, uh, that's just a trademark of great photographers. And then also it's crazy how different something can look, uh, with a different medium. So, this wasn't the most, you know, complex breakdown or anything, but just some things that I noticed and some things that I thought were interesting. Um, I highly recommend checking out more of his work. You can find videos on YouTube. There's a great documentary that he made on, um, I believe Vimeo and that's like three or $4. I highly recommend it. It's incredibly inspiring. Um, and you kind of get to see into his process and how he works. Um, but yeah, fantastic photographer. And I just thought it was interesting. Two photos, four decades apart and how at the core, they're exactly the same, even though they look a little different. Also, uh, when you see a photo from a great photographer, 
look deeper if immediately like when i first saw this i just kind of saw a bunch of clutter and then i really spent some time with it and now it's one of my favorite images of his um it's incredibly impressive what he was able to do here and it just took me spending a little bit more time with it taking a second look and um you, you find things uh, i mean you have to trust his eye one of my favorite books is um the democratic forest by uh, william eggleston and a lot of those photos are very difficult you know you don't see uh, what makes the photo beautiful immediately but then you look at it and you think what what drew him into taking this image and it, it becomes a lot more um a lot more profound and you, you get a lot more out of it but anyways sorry for rambling here hope you guys were able to take something interesting away from this uh, like i said go check out his work definitely worth it but until next time All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, that was that felt more right than <laughs> the others. You know, it was just quick. It felt more doable and actionable, um, easier to put together for sure. So, I I, I don't want to. There's a fine line between lowering the quality of your video and just managing expectations. And I want to you know, operate within that space. I don't want the video quality to be low, but I don't want to make, I don't want crafting the video to be so difficult that it deters me from doing the work that I need to be doing anyways. So anyways, hope you guys enjoyed and until next time.